Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. You should be able to see and hear me loud and clear. Usual drill. Let me know where you're from, whether you're a first timer uh, as well, please. Uh, and that'll be all very helpful. Now I'm going to start sharing my screen straight away. You will need, sorry, I'm two minutes late. You will need one of these uh, to take photos of some of the images as well so here we go sharing the screen with you right now we've got plymouth um sunny lester in your pajamas at 5 30 in the morning which means you are 12 hours behind what is that australia or something uh leeds wonderful swansea brighton salisbury hartford somerset chester fantastic fantastic namibia my god uh, phenomenal. Uh, Cardiff, yeah, sunny right? Atlanta, Georgia, Chris, fantastic. Uh, Berkshire, there's some posho places on there. Hampshire and Berkshire, we've got. Uh, I, good job I wore a tie. <clears throat> Not for you, Nottingham. Buckinghamshire. No, Nottingham, I, I love as well. Right. Stock market update. Here we go. Let's get on with it. So what am I going to talk about? I want to go through the fact that, yes, some people are worried that, wait a minute, is this a dip? Is it a buying opportunity? Where are the opportunities? Or is it something more serious and sinister with the market? And I'm going to show you uh, exactly what my thinking on that is and actually how to work it out yourself. I don't just want to feed you a bunch of stuff. And also, more importantly, the moves I've made uh, this week in the portfolio and why. But I also want to teach you how to do things in all of this. Now, I mentioned this thing, which this is this is one of the reasons I do these, these things. I love this. I don't have any specific questions to ask, so won't waste your time with a scheduled call. That's a win already. <laughs> Not really. But wanted to let you know I am still here watching and learning most of all he say thank you for helping me change mine and my family's lives that's what i love he went from 100k in 2021 to 400k uh by what was this 2024 three years fantastic wonderful really pleased there's more like that and during that period he also had two kids so i can imagine the stress and strain he was under to make sure he got it all right We've got a few first timers as well newton la willows bloody hell dave that is posh where's that from lovely island we've got there as well. Now, I want to show you this because we're having a bit of a dip at the moment in the markets and it's causing some people a degree of concern, which actually is perfectly fine. You discover your risk appetite in down markets, not in up markets. In up markets, we're all heroes. We've all got bravado. We're all punch drunk. Uh, uh, we've got Dutch courage in up markets. We all think we're going to be the world's next George Soros or uh, Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio or whatever. Uh, it's in a down market that you discover whether you've got uh, any of that courage. And of course, down markets in the S&P, intra-year drops of 14.2% are actually common. Positive years are 33 out of 44. It's one of the things I love about the American markets, as I'll show you, that statistically, it's not me that's actually clever or being clever statistically it's the fact that the market is more right very more likely to be up than down i don't know whether it's the american spirit i i did do u.s politics at university and i worked in the u.s congress and there is something called american exceptionalism it's 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 been studied it's an academic study subject and there's something there anyway whatever it is it translates into their companies, and I just want to ride those coattails for my SIPs, ISAs, and so on, my pensions, wherever you are in the world for your pensions, and so on and so forth. So where are we in terms of drops? We shouldn't be surprised that positive years, look at this, 26% up and yet 14% intra-year drop. That means from peak to trough, you know, from the high point to the low point, like this year, okay? It's having a little, so far, I think it's only down about 3%. But why am I pretty anticipating this? Well, I just want us to know context. Data is important. Otherwise, we make random assumptions that every moment we're about to have a crash, that markets can either only go uh, uh, ridiculously higher or phenomenally lower. Now, look at all these years with those tailwinds. 26%, 26, 27, 26, 34, 31, 27, 20, 20, 26. Those are the years I appear incredibly clever. I'm not... Eh, I've got a little bit of nouse about me. But in actual fact, I'm just riding the coattails. And what about those poor years where the market either closes lower 
there or has drawdowns and I've got to be able to navigate not panicking and getting out. Well, I'm going to talk about exactly how I do that. So there's two parts to it. In the good years, like last year, we get a tailwind. Everybody looks clever. But the real problem is the bottom half of the graph. How do we make sure in that period we get out when we should and we stay in when we should? Because that's the problem. How do you know it's a temporary thing and not a more, well, not a 38% drop and you wipe out half your pension? And I'm going to show you on the chart what we did in 2022. I can't say we'll get it 100% correct every time by any means, but I'll just show you in this webinar one of the things um, that we did, as well as giving you the stock market update and all the rest of it. Now, the S&P 500 has had five-month win streak, okay, from November to March. Um, and those are the only other times this century that's happened. Basically, it rarely happens. So the fact that April, and we're not even finished, we're, we're what? We're only halfway through April, and I'm already sounding like it's going to be a down month. Uh, I'm just saying it'd be pretty darn unusual for April also to be an up month, really unusual. Okay, but I just thought I'd sort of show you that in terms of performance. Now, what we've got to do, what our job is, well, is there some way of making sure this bottom part this bottom part, we can just remove a bit. I get that, not have the worst parts of that. And is there a way that we can pick stocks, cherry pick stocks that we do maybe occasionally, not always perhaps, but occasionally we do better than this. We get a tailwind and our picks do better. New Zealand. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking about. It must be New Zealand if he's 5.30, 11 hours. Yeah, it must be New Zealand. Uh so thank you very much for that. Now, here's a bit of other context. Now, we mustn't read too much into this. We mustn't just have blind faith that the markets will only ever go up. But if the S&P's return after five straight up months and when it's gone up more than 20%, then 12 months later, on average, it's up 14%. So we've got a tailwind. We've got something to work with. I mean, don't get me wrong. If the market's falling, it's going to be very difficult to make money those years. And those years, like 2022, which I'll come to in a second and what we did, We'll have to use a different strategy. We'll have to keep an eye, always keep an eye out. It's like having fire insurance policy. Uh, uh, just make sure that we've got some triggers in place uh, because it makes a really, really big difference. Uh, it makes a really, really... I'm going to pull this up on screen so I can see it and pull it up uh, later for you all to see. It makes a really big difference to our overall returns to avoid even a little bit of those few and far between negative years. Okay, few and far between. But even if we avoid a little bit, see, people sometimes think, oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. They don't come very frequently. I'll just take it in my stride. I don't mind those. Actually, it can hold you back. It can hold you can set you back a lot. Uh, and I'll come back to this. But I'll just show you an extreme example, which was meta. That's 2022. Okay, you lost six years, six years. And you might say, oh, no, but I made it back, Alpesh. Look, if I just held on, remember, time in the market, not timing. And that's what your IFA will tell you and your wealth manager. No, no, look, you came back. Well, no, actually, what happened is you lost all that. You made a 0% return over two years. Whereas if here, when it was on our approved list and the momentum wasn't falling down there and you got in in January, as we said, in in on our telegram then actually over the same two years you would have made 150 percent instead of zero there's a big difference there's and you wouldn't have lost during that period uh six years of your pension either so that little subtle bits of maths and that's the quickest way to show it goes contrary to what people assume and think and that's why it's really important to focus as much not on just the stocks that are worth holding and buying and when but also well and now's a good time to discuss it in april where the markets are a bit jittery actually how do we just reduce some of those downdrafts what simple ways can there be so it's not over complicated doesn't take up a lot of time uses maths because that's irrefutable you know one plus one equals two as opposed to oh no you've got to do lots of research read loads of things and hopefully you'll come to the right conclusion about what the rest of the market's thinking well that's pretty bloody difficult okay uh to get right it's it's gambling essentially uh and we don't want to gamble a higher january and february also could mean doesn't guarantee it that the bull market continues now the past is a guide 
but not a guarantee. It is not a guarantee of the future. Okay. Um, and as you've know and heard and all the rest of it. Now, I just thought this data is interesting. Don't don't overread anything into it. I'm just saying that, oh, that's interesting. The market tends to be up over those next 12 months. Listen, every record is a record until it's bloody broken. You know, just ask anybody who supports my football team. It all seems a record until, oh, no, no, it's not. Okay. But I just thought it was interesting. Um, just a quick thing I wanted to show you here, because sometimes people don't know this. That's the S&P 500. These are the top, top market cap companies. They also are pretty much the companies which determine whether or not the rest of the market's going up on the s and whether the S&P in index is going to go up or not, because it's heavily weighted towards the big companies. Okay. Now, this week, as I will explain why in a second, I sold out of my Microsoft and my two times leverage Microsoft. You might say, well, that's a bit premature. But my risk appetite is not based upon, oh, I can see into the future and I've got this secret memo I got from Alpesh in the future. You better sell Microsoft today. Uh, uh, and I expect I'll be buying it at some point in the future. And it may well continue upwards. It was because when I look at my whole portfolio and the amount of exposure I've got, particularly with leverage on some of these positions, and the fact that since January of last year, I've made a stonking massive gain on Microsoft, uh, uh, amongst others, and I'll come into some of the others. I thought, do you know what? And I'm going to show you the S&P and the broader market. I thought to myself, yeah, and I'll come back, as I said to Microsoft. I thought to myself, yeah, I think I'll take some of those gains now. Uh, let me just... Uh, move some of these segments here, and I'll I'll mention those again. Uh, but given since January, and it was on my Telegram anyway, since January 2023 to now, uh, we're up 83% on Microsoft, and the, the two times leverage on my son's junior ISA and my wife's SIP is obviously up around the 150% mark. And you might say, isn't it exactly two times that? No, that's not exactly how uh, leverage works. But the two times leverage uh, ETF is up 150%. Now, so why didn't you just buy only Microsoft? Well, if you go back, and I'm going to dig up the broadcast from January, I said exactly that. I know, and I said in January 2023, I know I'm going to regret not having just two times leverage Microsoft and all my money in that and nothing else. But I can't afford to take that level of risk. I'm a father and I'm a husband. And both my six-year-old son and my wife can be pretty violent, actually. That's not a cry for help. Um, th no, they, they, you know, I don't want to let them down. So I don't just have only one stock. Uh, and you might say, well, you underexposed yourself to Microsoft. You should have had double. But anyway, whatever that is, it doesn't matter. It's history. I will get back in at some point in the future. But I will also explain why and how I decide exit. Entries are simple. Is it in my approved list, which I'll come to in a second? Uh, and is it... Is the momentum not falling? Not falling. Okay. So that part was the simple part, January. But now, what was the exit? Well, the exit tends to be more mathematical. It tends to be a lot more, um, well, if you say maths is science, then a lot more scientific, less open to doubt. And I'll, I'll come to that. Now, you might be a bit more risk loving than me and wait, and that'd be perfectly reasonable. But there'll be a point beyond which, were you to hold it, I'd say red flag. Okay, and like I said, I do anticipate I'll buy it again in the future as I sold out in 2022 and bought it in 2023. So I know I'll be doing that uh, uh, time and again. Oh, and by the way, just while I'm on the subject, the reason to have sold it in 2022 alongside Meta and everything else, I will explain. And you might say, well, no, but you didn't need to. Look, you had a 0% return there. Well, actually, even better. I'll just draw that to there, shall I? Look, over two years, basically, one year, 10 months, you would have had a 0% return. Look, time in the market. Don't time the market. Look, you could have just stayed in. Uh, no, the reason we got out in January 2022 with a bunch of other stocks, I will explain. But actually, we got over that period uh, a, what was that, 60%, 70% return, whereas anybody else over that same two-year period got a 0% return. That's why occasionally, rarely, it is worth exiting even the best companies but rarely, not every five minutes, uh, uh, and I'll come to all of those explanations and how to make it easy so it's not complicated for you as well. Uh, just running through these, uh, and I will come to these. Apple, as you know, I sold half of a few weeks ago. Um, NVIDIA now exited because I never had leverage on that one. Uh, because similar reason to Microsoft. I just want to ease off some of these things. Uh, Amazon and Alphabet, I still hold. So does my son, and he holds them, uh, and I hold them, and my wife hold them. 
in double leverage form and in just ordinary form. Meta, we got out of uh, as well. Uh, uh, didn't have two times leverage in that for a while, so nothing there. And these don't have anyway, the bottom three. Um, so that's the S&P. You can take a picture of this. Capital market performance during times of war. Now, why do I mention that? Well, I don't know. Sometimes people say, are we in uh, World War Three? I don't know. But whatever it is, at times of war, the average return is 11.4%. The risk is 128 That's not a bad ratio. That's pretty bloody good, actually. Uh, but those are some of the average returns. And I just thought I'd mention, I mean, small caps tend to do better. But anyway, I'd rather be I'd rather the comfort of a large cap, actually, at time of war. Um, uh, and you can see the difference. By the way, history, no guarantee of the future at all. Okay? No guarantee at all. This could all be just coincidence. Could be There's no causation whatsoever and may never repeat itself. They're just random numbers. Okay? So what this is actually saying is that compared to... Uh, all other periods, it's a little bit better during times of war. Not all wars. Vietnam wasn't as good as, say, the Korean War, if if you'll pardon the expression good. Anyway, just it's just numbers. Uh, it's not, don't read too much into it. Similarly, market, market corrections since the Second World War, 26 corrections have averaged a decline of about 13% on the S&P over four months and taken four months to recover. And we will look at the S&P as well. This is from Goldman Sachs. Again, don't read too much into it because history does not guarantee the future as well i'll come into some of the others um intel i've exited as well uh paid for thankfully by microsoft intel ended up a bit of a damp squid but i'll come to that don't worry frequency of rolling two-year returns now at times when the market has a few jitters uh, and and i like i like this graph and i'll tell you why because i like data to overrule my heart or my gut instinct. I don't rely on my instinct. So let's have a look at that. So when the market, that's the S&P over two, two years. Now, when the market, and, and 2022, as you know, most of the year I had to hold cash uh, because the market just wasn't doing anything. Okay, so we had to hold cash during that period. And I'll show you what that period was. 2020, if you follow my Telegram, you'll know I said January, I'll have to wait till the February list, February, March, March, April, April, May, June, then July, we had some energy stocks, and that was just about it. So that year, the S&P was down 18, nearly 19%. At its worst drawdown point, it was down 25%, okay? In the end, it closed the year just off about 18%, roughly, right? Uh, and then, of course, in January, it was fine in 2023 again. Now, at the moment, the issue is, is this fall going to be like this, where it drops but resumes up? Or is it going to be like this, where it just keeps dropping? Okay, so basically, is it going to be small? And is it or is it going to be long? And if it's going to be small, well, what if you're risk averse, should you exit? Because obviously, if you're risk loving, you don't do anything, you just ride the horse. But if you're risk averse, should you exit? And then when and how and when do you get in again, as well? Okay, so we're going to come to some of those answers in a moment. But what I like about the fact that when something like this is falling, as it is there, and that's the S&P, and the big question of the day is, is it going to be that or is it going to be this? Uh, and I feel like I'm doing one of my old Bloomberg TV shows when I do that because it's exactly what I would have covered on air, and I'm going to share the same way with you. I like looking at things like this because I remind myself, well, average positive return, 32%, 88.5% of the time it's positive. And as I say, the average positive return, 32%. But I want to avoid these, even a, oops, even a little bit. I, I need to and must avoid these. Not completely. I can't remove all negative returns, and I can't remove that every single year all I do is ever go up. Okay, this data is taken from Bloomberg. Um, but if, if I could just remove the number of times, at least halve it, even a little bit, it'll make a massive mathematical difference to my positive returns, okay? So we will touch upon that. But I like this, that actually the odds are in my favor. This is not like the roulette wheel or the casino and blackjack or whatever, where all the odds are against me in any event. The odds actually are in my favor in any event. By the way, I wanted to show you this. Ignore, by the way, ignore this column. That data is not up to date, that part. Everything else is relevant okay uh dow 30 companies how did they do in the last 
I say crash, and I, we're not crashing, by the way. I just thought it would be a good time. So I looked at how they did in 2008, which was the financial crisis. Okay, How did the Dow companies do? Now, you'll notice, of course, well, there's a few lessons. Very few went up, hence why I don't like fund managers, because they would stay invested. So the point is, when the market drops sharply, everything drops. Okay, it doesn't matter whether it's a health company, an oil company, or a car company, or one which makes fizzy bloody drinks. They all drop. So this nonsense that fund managers have, we'll just diversify. We've got lots of, we're well diversified. They're, they're bloody idiots, because look, what am I showing you on screen? Oh, they only need to look at that, but they don't. It's like, okay, can I just show you that the data? Okay, where's your diversification now? So that was the first thing. Very few went up, which is why. I'll explain why and how we sidestepped 2022 and had to hold cash. Now, you might say, well, wait, wait a minute. Why did you hold cash? Why didn't you hold gold futures or Bitcoin? I uh, stick to what I know, okay? Stocks, cash. You might say, well, what, 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 what about options? You could have written some uh, call options at the top of the market or bought some puts. Yeah, cash stocks. Let's keep it simple for now, okay? Uh, so even the biggest companies can drop 50% plus. So much for, don't worry, Mr. Patel, not only are we diversified, but we've got your money in some really big names. Idiotic IFAs and wealth managers will say nonsense like that. And you just need to show them this. They really, how are you going to protect me? How are you going to protect? Oh, oh, well, don't worry. We, we won't ever put you in a risky market like the world's largest with the world's biggest companies. Oh, no, we're going to put you in uh, emerging markets instead. Um, okay, if the best and the biggest ain't going to do it, what the bloody hell is, right? Most people underestimate how much a giant can fall or indeed that it can actually bounce back quite sharply as I showed you with Meta. But the answer to that is therefore not, oh, just hold on, don't worry, it'll come back. Because as I showed you, you'll end up with 0% over two years, whereas somebody else on the bounce back would be making 150% over two years. In fact, post a crash is the best time to make the bloody money because that's when the bounce back is. But these idiots are saying, no, 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 just stay in, just stay in. Keep riding the loss. Absolutely crazy. So we need some simple mechanism to know when to get in and out. Uh, and yes, they rebound often. Fallers may have nothing to do with the cause of the crash. Again, oh, no, but I've got you diversified. Don't worry, if there's a financial crisis, it's okay. The companies I've got you in aren't in finance. Well, really sorry. Guess what? They're still going to bloody fall. Coca-Cola fell 26%. Yeah, well, it's sort of financial because people stop drinking fizzy drinks in a market crash. It's the cheapest piece of liquid you can buy. What, do you think they suddenly stop drinking Coke? And No, probably switch more people switch to it. Oh, everything's going to fall, okay? Um, uh, <laughs> how the hell do they stop drinking Coke, but they're still eating McDonald's then, right, in a financial crisis? And by the way, this doesn't mean that it, these are crisis proof by any means at all right some of the biggest companies in the world merck met dow 30 remember a representative of the u.s uh those linked most of the crash of course are most likely to fall the most so whatever the cause of the crash might be now i'm not saying we're in a crash but i think it's instructive that people look at data because there are too many assumptions and presumptions made in the market not least thanks to uh, 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 Aiden, I'll answer your question in a second. Uh, I thought you'd got out of what, Alan, of what? Um, uh, last year. Yeah, Intel, um, December. Um, it was a special situation, remember? Uh, from December. Uh, I'll show it in a second. S&P 500, any winners? Well, actually... There were winners out of the S&P 500 in a financial crisis. It's just that there's relatively few of them. Doesn't mean that there'll be winners again in a downward market, okay? There were some stocks in the S&P 500, which in a financial crisis, 2008, actually went up. Very few, very few. Uh, there were only, what is that, 15 companies, is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. About 15 companies which had double-digit gains that year. Okay, now we're not going to try and gamble which it might be and when 
the crisis is. We'll come to that. We're not going to try and gamble any of this. And you might say, well, no, surely, Alpesh, indices and index trackers, they're fine. They're a protection against market falls. And why am I talking about market falls when the market's just having this massive boosting rally? Well, I think it's a good time to educate you, and I'll come to the update part in just a second as well. Well, their prices, China fell 65%. India fell 55%, which is the worst, what you get with uh, with uh, those uh, Eastern countries. Well, the FTSE All World fell 43 so much for diversification. That's the whole old world. That's got about 4,000 bloody stocks in it. So I hate fund managers lying to you. They're telling you you're diversified, you're down 43. No, you better know a way of not losing half your bloody pension when that happens. Not only losing it, that's six years worth of gains gone in one go okay uh, uh what well FTSE 100 down 31 percent the dow 33 s p nearly 40 uh FTSE 250 so much for smaller companies relatively smaller down 40 um the FTSE 250 was down pretty much as much as the nasdaq 100 Oh, well, these Americans are a bit bloody risky with their tech companies, don't want to be in that. Well, actually, when the bottom fell out of the market, your FTSE 250, which is the 250 largest companies outside of the FTSE 100, okay, fell as much as the NASDAQ 100. So much for, oh, no, 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 don't want that risky Americans. I'm trying to counter every single argument and nonsense I've heard from IFAs and wealth managers. Anyway, I just wanted to show you this. So we're not going to be able to rely on this. Now, let's go back to the market as a whole. So where are we on valuations? Well, Microsoft's still expensive. You're paying $31 for every future dollar forecasted of profits, okay? Some of the cheaper ones are these, but as we know, valuation alone is not what moves stock prices. It is one factor. Energy in particular is looking attractive again as it did in 2022 in July, um, healthcare and so on. Now, I don't care what sector something is in. I care about its own specific valuation, revenue, growth, these are all factors. Valuation alone doesn't move stock prices. Growth is also relevant. Dividend yields are relevant. We know these things are relevant, not because I just said so and made it up, but because actually academic research shows that these factors, I mean, think about it, trillions are to be made by people who can look at the data. Well, do you not think somebody's looked at it? Yeah, loads of academics have. Um, I've written about the work of Eugene Famer, Daniel Kahneman, and uh, Richard Thaler in this book that I wrote quite a few years ago uh, in terms of what moves stock prices. So we're not just going to look at valuation, but if we, but valuation, those green ones are the cheapest, as it were. In other words, you're paying less when you buy the stock for every unit of future profits than you are with the ones in red. Okay. So where are we on the S&P? Well, the monthly, uh, sorry, the weekly, the weekly, let's get this straight. Now I'm going to show you something which I don't usually show you, which I don't usually show you. This is, look at this, so let's not confuse ourselves. This is the momentum on the weekly. It is crossed below its own moving average. Now, it's quite a bit of a warning. That's just the daily. Now, the daily might bounce up. The daily tends to be a bit premature, uh, a bit very sensitive. You can see what happens uh, in the past when it moves below the market tends to do that. Not everywhere. It's not guaranteed. And when it's going up, ooh, it tends to give us a pretty good signal. Okay. All I'm saying is, and I'll come to the other ones I looked at, that so I thought to myself, do you know what? I want to be a bit more risk averse. If, I, if I'm being risk loving, I'd ignore that. And I'd say, that's fine. That can happen. It'll still rebound up. If I'm being risk loving. If I'm being risk averse, which I can be at different, I have different appetites for risk at different times, specific to my own circumstances. And at the moment, given the gains that my portfolio has achieved and given uh, the exposure I have to leverage as well, I thought, you know what, I'll pay you. I just want to take a bit of money off the table here. You know, gringo, don't try and be too brave. Uh, and so uh, that would be my risk appetite. I look at this, I determine, eh, actually, now, during this whole other period, I wasn't risk averse at all, as you will know, because you've been listening to me since at least January 2023, I hope, but I wasn't risk averse at all, okay? And you'll remember back in uh, last year, around August, September, October, 
I was getting more and more risk averse and got rid of Tesla and so on. Because I said, again, I want to take some money off the table. So that's where I am now. And that is why. Now and why? Now, you might disagree with me. You might say, oh, you're absolutely wrong. Well, that's up to you. But that's why. Now, as I've said, and I'll come back to all of that. Don't worry in a moment. Now, as I've said, when I'm picking individual stocks, I need them to be undervalued. I need them to be growing. I need them to be producing dividend deals. I know value is twice as important as growth, which is twice as important as dividend deals. How? Well, the research is published in here. And you can download a free copy of the book if you wish. The research is now. I've got a lot of very nice reviews for this from Traders Magazine, from Peter Temple of the Financial Times. He's written a review on the back, an intriguing book by one of the savviest traders around. It explores areas like asset allocation, diversification. Don't worry, I'm not selling the book to you. You can download it for free. Uh, I'll give you the link. It was alpishpatel.com forward slash links. You don't even have to wait. Uh, that are often neglected by little understood by the average private investor. Read the book and you're guaranteed to be a better investor. Peter Temple, Financial Times columnist. Okay, one of the reviews. There's others. Uh, there's a Bloomberg review, and there's a review from uh, Bernard Opatiu, who runs a two billion dollar hedge fund as well. Uh, but it's free for you, okay, for for watching this. Uh, now, I need that to be green. I need cash return on capital invested to be green. I need momentum to be up because it tends to persist, but it's not guaranteed. I need high Sortinos and high Alphas. Uh, they're less important, by the way. Sortino is a hedge fund. Uh, what's well, particularly used in the hedge fund industry, which is average return versus the downside risk of missing it, the risk of missing it to the downside. And alpha is market goes up, you got more market falls, you don't fall as far. Okay, so I'll come to which stocks and how I pick them. So over the past week, that's been the market pretty bloody awful. Okay, pretty bloody awful with the exception of NVIDIA yet again, a few industrials. Now look at this, those energy stocks, which are undervalued, and those health ones, well, they did hardly moved as well. Um, Stan, I'll answer your question. Um, James, I'll answer yours as well. Thank you for putting those in. I will come back um, to them as well. I'll just continue with my flow for the moment. Now, you see, virtually everything was down, which is another reason why I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, uh, I'll take some money off the table. ETF performance, uh, I will, as I said, do a separate one on this. In fact, my team, I have a graphics team and a data team. The data team pull all the data from the company's cash flow statements, profit and loss statements, and um, balance sheet, and from the stock market, from London Stock Market, uh, London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, S&P, and the graphics team just put all the PowerPoints together for me, and they source those. Um, so I will, and they're doing one at the moment on ETFs for me, which um, didn't arrive in time for this. So I'll do that possibly tonight. So keep an eye out on my Telegram and my YouTube channels uh, as well. Uh, and I'll I'll cover that because I promised I would. Now, the S&P year to date is up 5.9%. The, the NASDAQ's up 5.28. The UK markets are barely up. And so is the Dow barely up. Okay, that's where things are. What's been leading the way? If you're into sectors, I'm not. I don't gamble which sector is going to win. Energy. Remember, it was undervalued. It's one of the ones which has been leading away. Communications, industrials, financials, technology is actually all the way down here. Okay, it's not even set for promotion in the field in footballing terms. It's way down. Um, traveling in the van, everything is shaking. <laughs> Let me know where you're driving to, Stan. Please stay safe. I mean, I'm assuming you're not the one driving, for God's sake. I Please tell me you're not driving, Stan. Uh, uh, okay, so those are the sectors, but I don't gamble on sectors. Companies are factories for making money. So I care what the company's doing in terms of numbers from its profit and loss. All companies have P&Ls, balance sheets, and cash flow statements, and they all have a stock price. Great. So that's the one thing they all have in common. So I care about that, not gambling on, oh, I think energy might be well, and I think technology might be well. Because those kinds of gambling stories is what IFAs and wealth managers use to sound clever. And I've got more qualifications than any of them. And I can tell you it's bullshit when they try and sell you a story narrative. You know the bit where people go, you can't forecast the market. Can't forecast the market based on these narratives and stories. The best you can do is have the data and take a something of a scientific approach. Because one thing we do know about stocks is undervalued ones 
and high growth ones and dividend yielding ones with good cash returns on capital invested and high sortinos in their stock price, i.e. high average return, which they consistently achieve and high alphas, i.e. when the market goes up, they do more. When the market drops, they don't drop as far. They tend to do better, but not guaranteed to, than everything else for obvious reasons, for very bloody obvious reasons. Okay, so I try not to gamble on narratives and stories uh, because, well, with all your narratives and stories in the world, uh, did you see in January that Iran was going to launch 300 missiles against Israel? No, of course you didn't. Nobody did. So great. Thanks very much. Those bloody narratives and stories worked. Couldn't even do it on data. All you can do on data is say, well, if I have companies which are resilient, I undervalued high growth dividend yielding, then they should withstand those kind of market noises and turbulences, shouldn't fall. If there's a headwind, they shouldn't fall as far. And if there's a tailwind, they should do incredibly well, like last year. But we don't know what the future holds. So the best thing we can do is make sure we have those criteria. So what's been the factors? Growth has been an important factor, for instance. Uh, value has been important. Momentum has. Well, as you will know, I pick stocks which are in the middle here. Their value, growth, income, okay, momentum. So they have to be that tiny little thing. That's why I need 10,000 stocks. That's why my first column in the Financial Times in 1999 was I'm selling all my UK holdings and only buying US ones because I had 10,000 to pick from. I needed the bigger data set to succeed. It just so happens the American markets went nuts. That helped me call that luck. But actually, I just wanted to make sure I get that tiny bit in there because I'm not gambling whether it's going to be um, uh, uh, growth or value or momentum. What I'm doing is I'm just going to say, actually, I'm going to win whichever it is because my company, oh, it's growth. Great. We've got growth stocks. We tick that box. Value. Oh, got value stocks. Over the past year, the Nasdaq's up 35%. So 12 months ago, from 12 months ago yesterday, uh, today to now, it's up 35%. The s and is up 22 The Dow's up 11 The UK is up an anemic 3%. Well, the Nasdaq has done 10 times better in the past 12 months than the UK. 10 times better. So consider this. And last year wasn't, or the last 12 months have not, they're not typical. There is no such thing as a typical year in the market. Okay. But let's assume it was typical. You only need one of those years in your pension. Get your 35%. Let's say the rest of your time you're only making three. Well, you got your 135% year. I'd rather do that than have just a load of 3% or 4%, which is what the IFAs. Now you can see why the IFAs are trying to sell you 4.5% is what they're going to get you. And please give us 10 years in which to achieve it. Well, bloody American ones aren't going to say that, are they? Uh, these, this is just data. This is just information for you to look at, uh, not reading anything into it. Uh, the ones which have done the best in the S and P 500 over the past month, the ones which have done the worst over the past month in the S and P 500 is over there. FTSE 350, the 350 largest U UK companies. They're not ones I hold, uh, which ones have done the best, which ones have done the worst. Okay. So it's just information for you. Now let's go to the S and P. This is now the, the normal thing I show you each week. Where are we on the S&P uh, weekly and monthly? So the monthly is still rising. Okay, You could argue it's a bit flat. The weekly is now crossed below its moving average. And it did that last here. Okay, And when it did it last, the S&P fell 11%. So brace yourselves. Brace yourselves. And I've drawn what an 11% drop looks like. Okay, It looks like that. So brace yourself. I think we're going to get that. However, last time, the MACD didn't cross below its own moving average. So the market then rebounded. So it done this. It went up, went down, went up. Okay, went down, went up, sorry, went down, then went up. I think it's going to continue doing that, as opposed to this, where it went up and then went down a lot. Okay, because the monthly MACD hasn't done that. Now, do I think the monthly MACD is going to do that? No. I don't think it's going to cross below its own moving average. So if you're risk-averse like me, you might start easing back on your positions as I started doing here last year just because the weekly MACD is below its own moving average as it did there. But 
you wouldn't have been in anyway because the monthly was falling, so you shouldn't even be in. Okay, so here, if you're risk averse, you get out. If you're more risk loving, you'll say, no, I'll just weather it through. It's fine. I'm more risk loving. Okay, simple as that. Uh, FTSE 100, as I said, it's going to run out of steam, and indeed, it's flopped back a bit. Okay, the NASDAQ is now doing that. Now, I'm going to teach you something else. Whilst this is the monthly MACD and should continue like it did here, because what you do is you go back, you say, where was it in the past? Oh, it's there. You can get all this from Yahoo Finance, and it does this. It still had room to go up, so it still had room to go up. What I'm going to show you is this. Look at the drawdown that you can have in an upward move. That's an upward move, but look at the drawdowns you can have. Drawdown means from peak to trough. That's the drawdown depth. That's the duration it took to get back two months, and that was the depth. Here, one month, and that was the depth. So I'm going to say to you, we're going to have a drawdown of maybe about 11% in the s and I don't know for sure. Hopefully we won't. I might be totally wrong. Great. Uh, and I think it'll last between four to eight weeks. Might be longer. Well, look, I've got another broadcast on Friday, so I can always adjust when I get more information. I'm not one of those people who says, well, I'm, I'm going to ignore all future information, and today's what I'm going to stick to. But I'm just saying, as things stand at the moment, that's what my inclination is. Now, as you know, with Apple, I got rid of 50% because the monthly MACD fell below its own moving average. Now, I got into Apple ages ago, April, uh, sorry, January of 2023, because the momentum wasn't falling, it might be in February, um, the momentum wasn't falling, and it was on the approved list. What's the approved list? For those of you who follow me a lot, you will know it is my database, which says all of these have to be all green. All the top five columns all have to be green. So none of these stocks, none of these are suitable. None of these are suitable. Okay, so you can imagine out of 10,000, I really am picking the best. Well, it is for my son's, my six-year-old son's junior ISA, and you don't want to disappoint that boy. Okay, so what, what's the Apple position at the moment? Same as before. I am currently only holding 50%, so the other half. Okay, uh, forget that one. Alphabet, that's the great investments program. Microsoft, as I've said to you, I got out. Now, I've been saying why for a while. That's what's called a bearish divergence. That's going up. That's falling. You might ignore all of that. You might say, I've exited prematurely. I'm too prematurely worried. Yeah, but that's, and this is a bit important. I'm not in the forecasting business of saying, you should copy what I do. I can see in the future. I can't see in the future. I don't have a time machine. Given that I don't have a time machine, I've made massive gains in this and a few others. And I see the S&P doing what it's doing. It is perfectly legitimate for me to say, oh, I'm just going to take a bit of money off the table. Thank you very much. You might be in a different risk category. You might have two private jets, for all I know. Two more than me. Now, I've also said to you time and again, it is overbought. And the last time it was up here, it had peaked. And I said, sooner or later, we're going to get this. Okay? And the worry is it does a bit of that. Now, whether it does that or this, I don't want to wait for a 12% drop. I would rather, given the gains I've had, given that the weekly has fallen, maybe look to get back in a bit later. Now, you might say, well, you're going to go all that trouble of getting in. And what if you just get back in and all you've done is it's it's at the same level? Well, so be it. That's fine. I just would rather pocket a bit of that capital now. And the reason I'm talking you through all of this is so you can understand the right way, I believe, of thinking of it. Stan, I'll answer your questions in a bit. Um, at the end of Feb was uh, 5% up. And Dafa, would you still do... Uh, if it drops. Well, I'll answer that. Can you pay the joint fee? Um, S, sorry for bad way. I'll come to all of that in a second. Disney. Where are we on Disney? Okay, well, still doing that. And you might say, well, why haven't you got out of that? Well, I'm fine with that. Okay, it's got more to run. I'm okay with that one. Uh, by the way, you can see here what the banks think. Not that I care what the banks think, because they tend to be, as I've said on academic research shows, and I've published in the Financial Times this, they tend to be over-optimistic um, anyway. Uh, you can see more of you know, why pension fund managers should be locked up on my YouTube channel uh, as well. Now, NVIDIA, what's my view on this? Why did I exit? Probably prematurely, you might say. Well, 
and I'm sure in future at some point I'll probably get in. Um, the reason is with the monthly now flattening, this hasn't crossed below its own moving average. So you might say you're just too early, Alpesh. But if the MACD is rising, I'm happy. If it's sideways, that's an amber alert. If it's falling, that's a double amber alert. And of course, if it falls below its own moving average, I definitely want to get out. But you might as well, that's a bit late. Look, you've missed too much of a drop. Whereas here it was straight. You could have got out sooner. So that's why the exit happened there. And the other reason it happened is because that's a bloody big fat profit we're all sitting on. And I'd like to liquidate some of it now. Thank you, if that's okay with you. Well, why didn't you get out here, Alpesh? Well, because it just didn't fall enough. Well, it hasn't fallen there. Yes, but the difference is that, I think, looks a lot more worrying than even that did. Here, that was just, okay, it's overbought, but I'll just wait for the price to drop X, say 15, 20, 25%, which it never did. But now I don't even want to wait for it because that is just really overbought. Now, I might be wrong. It might just continue going up. But I'd rather just get out now. You might say, why didn't you get out 50%? Well, that's my risk appetite. You might get out less. You might stay in. If you're risk loving, you wouldn't do what I did. You'd wait for it to drop 10, 15, 20% before you got out. If you're risk averse, then you'd say, you know what? That's really overbought. It's now starting to turn. Given what I've said about the S&P as well, let's start moving out of this. Now, Tesla, as you know, we got out in October. Why? For exactly the same position I'm in now, I said, look, I want to ease back on some of my equities. And of course, as soon as I said that, and also, of course, the MACD monthly was falling below, below its moving average, that went up. But now it's fallen back and it's still not a special situation yet. And I don't know when it will be, but I'm covering it because it's in the news. Um, uh, I trust Arpish Romani. AP starting to, what's AP? Um, oh, hi, Will. Recent AP picks are a bit concerning. I don't know what AP is. Uh, okay, Meta uh, is uh, there. Okay, great investments. Um, NXP, NXP. Um, it's all they're all going to come off a bit, as you've seen when the market's correlated, as it always is, and even more so to the downside. They're all going to come off a bit, uh, but I'm happy to wait for these under the normal rules. The normal rules being. If it drops there, then we'll get out. Or if it drops 25% from the high since I bought it, or if you're more risk averse, 10%, 15%, you'll exit some of yours depending on your own risk appetite. Qualcomm, all still fine and waiting. That needs to do that. That The weekly is coming off a bit. Now, remember, in an upward move like this, uh, uh, OAP's me, uh, that's the upward move. Well, it's not me who might be disappointing. It's the market. I, I wish I could make it always go up. So where are we? That's going up uh, there. And you can see what the drawdowns can be in an upward move. Now, at this point, some people will cry and say, oh, my God, why isn't it going up every single day? I, I want my ice cream. I want my stock to go up. Uh, and they won't even wait. Okay, so that's the depth and that's the duration. And you will get that sometimes. You will get people saying, oh, well, well why, why is it not going up every single day? Mommy, it used to go up every single day. Um, and that doesn't happen sometimes. And that's because we only have to wait on that and say, well, that's fine. Or perfectly happy. ServiceNow, as you know, uh, Intel was the one exited in December, but we continue following it. And it's not been that great, unfortunately, since uh, then Netflix, not one I bought, but one that I've been covering since then. Uh, and that's been rising rather nicely still. But again, if you're risk averse, you're probably thinking that's overbought. I think I want to get out now, especially in light of what you've said on the S&P. And if you did that now, I would think it was perfectly. Um, uh, uh, oh, Alpha Picks from Seeking Alpha. I don't look at Alpha Picks um, on their will. Um, so I don't know, um, uh, Stan, uh, about alpha picks. I uh, I just don't know them. Recent alpha picks are a bit concerning. Fair enough. Uh, PayPal um, is there. Um, thanks, Stan. I thank you that you trust me with your money. Thank you very much. Uh, PayPal pff, shows you that you can't use MACD alone. You have to look at the fundamentals. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the bellwether ones, like Netflix, which I said I don't own, like Tesla, which I don't own, but they do tend to set the theme for the market as a whole sometimes uh, as well. I've talked about YouTube, haven't I? I've got 1.3 million views now on go through a load of pension funds. Um, that's Cisco. Uh, 
just waiting for the same old story after a while it becomes which is which way is the macd monthly going the weekly will tell you in the short term what's happening the monthly will tell you going forward however the entry criteria is not based on that the entry criteria is based on value growth income cash flow sortina uh uh and all of these other factors the exit i'm going to show you a very little flow chart there you go it's this bit the exit is this has it been 12 months after which you refresh the data and do it all again for a 12-month holding? Has it fallen 25% from the peak? Or have you become risk-averse, for instance, as I showed you exactly that I've become a bit more risk-averse in, say, Microsoft, and therefore I sold between 10 to 100% depending on my risk appetite. Now, let's say I didn't want to do that. Let's say I'm too busy to faff around with all of that. No, no, then you've got a very simple rule. You just follow this that one and that will give you an adequate return it will give you a very good return a market beating return um this one takes up a bit more time but gives you a bit better return that's all now if you haven't got the time you just use a simple mathematical formula 12 months or 25 percent from the peak simple if you want to have a bit more um oomph to it as it were then and i'll tell you why i think it's worth it i'll just move this one back i think it's worth it is uh the meta example this is the meta example uh meta platforms okay this is why i think it's worth it now you could have waited for a 25 percent drop you would have lost a bit more why do we have any stop loss at all because we don't want to lose 80 percent so just to reiterate we got in here because the momentum wasn't falling it was on the approved list we got out here because we didn't wait for the 25 percent rule which we could have done but this shows you it's a little bit better if you've got the time and energy to make sure the monthly MACD isn't falling below its own moving average. Very simple. Very simple. I've tried to make it the most simple as possible. All those books I've simplified into what I've just told you because I think simpler is better. And there's no narratives involved. There's TikTok. Um, there's YouTube, just a reminder. And please, there's LinkedIn as well and tons of client reviews and all of this. Um, I want to show you something else. I won't go through all of this again, because I think in the past I've done this. You might have seen this before where somebody over 10 years, because their pension was so rubbish, only got 20%, whereas those are the longer term growth. So I want to answer some of the questions. Um, and again, I've done these slides in the past. Um, how do we do in 2023, 2021? We can only do amazing bits. Our, 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 our performance goes everywhere from one extreme to the other. The poor extreme was 2022 when the markets fell. We had to hold cash for month on month on month. The amazing extreme was when the markets soared in 2023 and 2021 because we had a bunch of high sortino. Remember, that's high average return and very downside, low downside risk, high alpha. In other words, market goes up, they go up even more. So bloody hell, 2023, 2021, we did incredibly ridiculously well. Um, we could go into cash. That's why we average high numbers. Um, monitor it so we could no to go into cash we just closed our eyes and didn't look at it for five years we'd be a bit screwed okay high croaky cash return on capital invested because it's a goldman sachs formula which i showed you earlier um these were high croaky stocks and hold for 12 months and sold anything which drops more than 25 percent from the high which in 2022 none of the ones we had did it we just had a ridiculously good year this year may or may not be like that 2022, I thought was going to be a good year, ended up being one holding cash most of the year. And the good years make up for the bad. The good years make up. So you can imagine a year like last year, I wish we got that every year. I wish I could guarantee that every year. No, it's because there was a massive tailwind. It wasn't me. I, If it was me who was that clever, I would have invented NVIDIA. Or as in the film, The Social Network, if you'd thought of Meta, if you thought of Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. I didn't invent it. We just rode their coattails or Amazon. You might as well have bloody obvious easy ones to do. Microsoft, Alphabet, Apple, any idiot could have picked those. Yeah, absolutely. And this idiot did. Okay. And this idiot had cash in 2022. And I went through some of the broadcasts we did in 2022. And I kept saying to people, well, I wish here are the stocks which are going up. I said, do you want any of these? And they didn't look good. The ones which did go up in 2022. Eventually, the only ones that looked good were energy ones. Okay, which was fine. So anyway, that was a non-typical year, which even simple maths will tell you. Otherwise, if I get 80% a year, I'm 52, I'll be the richest man on the planet by now. Might never get that ever again. Um, forget AI. 
Uh, I don't want to go into that. Let's say over 10 years, you can do a little bit better by the simple rules I've told you. 12 months, 25% from the peak, or the monthly MACD falls below its own moving average, okay? And you pick stocks based on value, growth, income, cash flow, Sortino, alpha, please. If you can't pick them on any of those, then value, growth, income, and a rising monthly MACD, and preferably a rising weekly one at the same time. Then just keep it even simpler. I'm trying to keep it even simpler for you, okay? And let's say you do a little bit better then over 100K, over 10 years, you should turn that into a million by improving on the market's natural return by a little bit. Not excessively, but by a little bit. And you'll have some years which give you crazy returns, like 2023, and in any seven-year period, you'll have some years which give you 0%, like 2022. Okay, And that's what it should come to. And that's the goal uh, for my son's junior ISA and for my family. It's as simple as that. Something else I want to show you. A very little difference in performance, I say very little, a difference in performance of 5%, how much it makes. And you'll say, well, I know that because maths is crazy when you compound it. 10% gets you that, which is the market average, 333,000, okay, after 15 years. 20% gets you 1.7 million. To get more money later in life, you can either... Start sooner. Well, you haven't got a time machine, so you can't start any more than now. Save more. Well, thanks, Alpesh. Bloody you boring person. I wanted to go out for dinner tonight. I wanted to go on a holiday. Well, no, scrap all of those. Just keep saving it. We don't want to do that. Or focus on improving performance. Those are the three things. And improving performance is the easiest one of those three to do. Because you ain't got a time machine, and you've got a finite amount of capital. And that's why I spend a shed load of time, not just 18 odd books and financial times comms, all the rest of it, trying to improve performance because it is the easiest, laziest thing you can do to make more money. It's a hell of a lot easier than starting a business or getting a job or anything else, I'm afraid. Improve your performance. Okay. And with my big mouth, I put my money where my mouth is. I beat the bugger. So the Financial Times said to me in 2004, all right, forecast the market over a one-year period, and I won. Uh, and I know I've repeated this time and time again to some of you, so apologies for that. That's me. That's that idiot. They gave him $9.2 billion. I'm not going to talk about justice and how unfair that is um, or the fact that because I was fat, they didn't give it to me, and they gave it to him because he was a bit more chiseled, and that was all there was to it, the difference between us. He barely beat the bloody cat, Jasper the cat there, that is a num which picked... Um, numbers off the floor. Seriously. I, I do not trust fund managers and wealth managers. Not because they're congenitally stupid. It's because they're handcuffed. They're handcuffed for a very, very simple reason. Oh, by the way, um, this is not a Barclays advert. It's just to say it's very easy to open a SIP or an ISA or a 401k, wherever you are in the world. Um, when the market falls, Okay, why, this is why fund managers, IFAs, and wealth managers are conflicted and handcuffed to delivering poor results, even though they deny it. It's not because they're fraudsters or they're idiots. They neither are negligent nor fraudulent. It's neither of those things, nor are they reckless. It is this. When the markets are going up, they're going to market like crazy. Of course, in a rising tide, all boats rise. When the market's falling, they're not allowed to own more than 5% cash. It's in their prospectus in their mandate when they launch the funds for the simple reason that the regulator won't permit somebody to charge you to hold your money. Okay, perhaps they should. So they end up, as you saw, when things fall, everything falls and they lose six years of your mortgage. Now they know every seven years, maybe they're a bit fraudulent, they know every seven years that's going to happen. So they know for five years, they can advertise like crazy and tell you to hold your money with them for 10 years. And you do that, and they keep collecting the fees, and they're laughing, and they say, no, 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 look, when it drops, Alpesh, look, it comes back. You've got a 0% return. You not, you lost nothing, they'll say. You lost nothing over those two years. But you did. You'll say, oh, yeah, look, we didn't lose anything. What a good fund manager. Over those two years, we lost nothing. Well, actually, you did. You lost the 150% gain I got. And they'll say, yeah, but we know opportunity cost, money you didn't actually have, which you could have gained, is not as painful as actually losing something. So they'll tell you, just stay in, just stay in, don't worry. But that's because they have to hold equities and they want you to stay in and they do that sleight of hand magic trick and say, look, you lost nothing. You did. You lost your future. 
you got 333,000 in your pension instead of 1.7 million after your 15 years. You lost the life you could have had. And you might think, well, it's just how it is. And they rely on the fact that people are going to keep saying that and not know any better. But anyway, I'm just, I, I, I labor the point for which I apologize. Uh, SIPs are very easy. You go online, whichever the provider, whether it's a H, H&L, AJ Bell, Barclays, whoever it is, and you fill in the forms and they're very easy. They'll even transfer it from your old place. They're all much of a muchness. That those prices don't bother me much when I'm talking making thousands and thousands. What the hell do I care whether it's £12 or £20 I'm paying uh, when I'm holding things for 12 months anyway? On the whole, very easy to buy and sell online. Like I've already talked to you about how bad fund managers are. That's how we enter, how we exit. I've already explained, and that's probably the most important thing. And at the moment, I'm a bit more risk averse, as I've said to you, with some of my holdings. Uh, I tick those boxes. 12 months, 15 to 40 stocks, usually about 20. Uh, and if it drops 25% from the peak. By the way, I want to show you something else. I want to show you the portfolios of some of the billionaires and explain to you why I'm so concentrated in my holdings. And then I'll answer your questions. And then I'll go because the hour is up and I don't want to um, keep you behind any longer. So this is from Goldman Sachs Wealth Management. I think it's too conservative. Uh, so do most of my students. Uh, I've got 90% in equities. Well, on average, most of the time, but at the moment, I've got a bit more in cash because of some of the sales I've already told you about. Uh, okay, and here we are, um, about 20 stocks, and that'll do it for me. But there's another reason. These are the portfolios of a couple of the billionaires. You'll notice after their eighth largest holding, don't go and just out and buy these. He bought Coca-Cola in 1968. All right, there's a reason he still holds it. It's because it pays a shed, like the number of shares he owns, it pays him a bucket load of dividends uh, each year. Uh, because he bought it at, you know, I don't know, six cents. So he bought a billion shares, right? Well, $22.4 billion worth of shares uh, in today's money. Moody's uh, is only got 2% of after his eighth holding. Bill Gates, Coca-Cola has only got 1.25 after his eighth holding. My point is they're very concentrated. Put all your eggs in one basket. Sorry, put all your eggs in a basket and watch the basket. You can only do that if you've got transparency of data, and you've got knowledge. So the data I've got and the knowledge, so I'm not worried about all of that. So that's there. Uh, that's me at my book launch. I'm going to start answering some questions. How is SJP? God, SJP, you know, Alan. St. James has placed so many criticism there. So I've got your site going risk off at the moment. Yeah, yeah, Simon. Bloody hell, Simon. I think I've made that clear enough, my friend. Yes, I'm more risk averse now. God, shall I just... In case that's not clear, yes, yes. Um, uh, and it might only last four weeks or five weeks. We're making sale decisions. Do you use US dollar or convert to UK pounds? No, no, I, 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 I'm, I don't do any conversions in the sense of do I make a decision based on dollar and pound? Not at all. When it's time to sell, I sell. Because the amount of sums we're making, there's some bitter, I know. Uh, you're not bitter much, are you? No, I'm not. Did you not get the ironic joke? uh there about that i'm not bitter i didn't get nine billion hmm. uh are you looking to buy any no no not at the moment now, this is a brilliant question simon am i looking to buy any if there's a big drawdown i make decisions when i need to make them why would i make that decision about when i'm I, yes i'm going to buy microsoft at some stage in the future that's all i can say i don't know when that is why would i fix myself now to it um jen is it time to ask it uh what's jen General Electric, you mean? I've not looked at it on there. Can you look at JP Morgan? Ooh, okay, I'll come back to some of the stocks. General Electric and JP Morgan, I'll look at. I think I've, I've still got JP Morgan. I've still got JP Morgan. If you're one of my great investments program clients, um, then you'll get the JP Morgan and all the rest of them later on. There's, you're going to get a 100-slide presentation later on. Here we are with JP. Okay, now it's fallen off a bit. Like, they're all going to look. Look, they're all going to have this drawdown danger and an uptrend, which is that much of a decline. That's the depth. That's the duration. How long did it take? It took that long from July to November. Yeah, July to November. What's that? Six months? Five, ugh, five four months. Four months. Do your maths, Alpesh. Four months. Four months to go back to where it is. This might take four months from April to August for it to go back. Well, why don't you sell it? Well, I'm not trading my investments. But Arpish, look, it's fallen below. It's moving average and it's overbought. Well, I might have to look at that when I look when I do my private client update tonight. I might say I'm getting out of it. Um, 
when I do the private client ones, saying, well, it's over, boy, it's got to the peak. Yeah, actually, it's time to get the hell out. And you might say, oh, you missed it. You could have got out last week. And I said it's getting overbought. I don't really worry about the odd percentage here or there. Um, hi, Arpesh, what's the minimum guarantee return? That, um, uh, there's no guarantee of any returns from the market. The market does, as I kept saying in this, I can't guarantee the market's going to do anything. How Chris, did you come out 100% for Microsoft and NVIDIA? Yes. Which is probably more risk averse than most of you would be. I think most of you would say, no, no, I'm going to stay in. Um, but yeah, I did. And the reason is I've got two times leverage and I've got a ton of exposure to the equity markets. And I showed you what the SP is looking to do for the next few months. So I thought, do you know what? Um, one of the easiest ones to get out. Remember, oh, by the way, this is the other reason why. And I want you to sort of understand how to make your own decisions based on the thinking that I have in mind. If I've got 20 stocks, I normally put 5% in each, except for the quality five. If I hold any of those, it can be up to 15% of those. So I had, from a starting point in January 2023, 15% in Microsoft, let alone the double leverage my son and my wife had. So I had a massive exposure to it. And it's had a massive freaking return. So that's why um, I wanted to say the bad news is I'm a teetotal vegetarian. So what the F am I going to spend the money on? Um, and I like driving line bike, riding line. Today I had to go in the city. Do you think I took, I don't know, a Lamborghini or a Ferrari or a McLaren? No, I took a line bike. I live in bloody London. Um, recent alpha picks. Oh, I see, Will. Thank you. Everybody thought you're criticizing me, uh, uh, alpha picks. I, I don't follow... Um, the alpha thing. Thank you. Are you buying any stocks with money from Microsoft? No. Brilliant question, Chris. No, I'm risk of this. I'll wait for the May list, but I doubt I will in May, but let's have a look. So I get the monthly list and at the moment, I'll just keep it as cash. Is Autodesk a unique situation given the drop along with the investigations into it? Um, so there's this, uh, and again, you raise a very good question, um, which is, well, wait a minute, Alpesh. What if I don't want to get out uh, because I think I don't want to wait for a 25% drop. I want to give it a bit more room, let's say. Um, try and give you a good example of that. Let's give, I'm going to go, let's give Apple. Let's go to Apple, okay? You might say, well, Alpish, do I have to stick to the 25% rule? Where did that come from? Well, it came from 2004. We were trying to do a little simple thing in one of my books to prove that fund managers can be beat for a very low zero cost have a simple algorithm, buy the stocks, hold them for 12 months. If it drops 25% from entry, not from high, from entry, that was the rule, you can outperform them as long as you pick them on value, growth, income, rising MACD on monthly, Sortino Alpha. So that generated on the UK markets about 16 to 18% per annum. And the UK markets were up 1% per annum over the same uh, from 2004 to 2021. All right. So the point, that's just UK. Okay. Um, same thing applies to the US. The US just went through the roof. Ridiculous. Um, so you don't have to use that rule. It's just that we didn't test other hypotheses like, well, what about 26%? What about 24%? What about 20? What about this? We didn't test every single hypothesis under the sun. Um, it was good enough. You know, if I get a 40% year one year, I'm happy. I don't think to myself, shit, I could have been 40.1. I, I really don't think like, I don't think, oh, well, I could have saved five pounds more on the brokerage. I'm not that stingy or greedy. I just am not. Because uh, life's too short. I've got a six-year-old son. I'd rather spend the extra time not going through number crunching. Sure yeah, you see? Not even the iPhone understands that. So that's that's just some of the thinking there. Um, so let's you add this. You might say, well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to wait for a 15 or 25% drop. I'll give it more room. I'll give it 30. All I'm saying to you is whatever space you're going to give it, please don't give it 80%. Okay, let's take Meta as an example. Let's say you said, no, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I want to give it a 25% go, a 30% drop. That's fine. Please don't give it an 80% drop. That's all. You can find your own balance, but the answer is going to be somewhere between zero. If you give it no chance to drop at all, you'll be getting out within three seconds. If you get a hundred percent chance, you'll lose all your money. Um, no, Ian, it looks like they're referring to alpha um picks. So it wasn't me. Also stand alpha picks, thank you. From seeking alpha, no Keith, alpha picks, not me. Uh, as Stan said, I trust you with my money. AP is starting to disappoint the alpha picks is not me, mate. Thank you very much. Oh, Will, you're so generous. I better go. Do you approve CNC in the end? What CNC? 
Um, thank God we have it. Oh, thanks, Will. I really appreciate that. I'll push. It's easy to come to you when you're 200% up. Not so easy when you've just started and only 5% up. Well, the great thing is, of course, life is long. You know, think of this. Oh, I've got to tell you this. Think of the people who joined me in 2023, January 2023. And I'm saying to them in January, no, wait till February. February, wait till March. March, wait till April. April, wait till May. It wasn't until they got into 2024 that they said, bloody hell, after two years, we've realized we saved a fortune on the down year and on the up year, we had all that money saved to make the return. And that literally happened. I had people telling me that. So you can't judge it in a month. Um, thank you. What's what's Champions? League? Oh, sugar. Yeah, no, I forgot about Champions League. What's it showing on? I'm not going to pay for BT's bloody sport as well. I've got Disney, I've got Netflix, I've got Paramount. I'm going to go bankrupt on all those subscriptions, but I do want to watch the Champions League. Uh, concurrent tech. I don't know concurrent tech at all. Thanks, as always. Um, guys, one final thing I'll leave you with, which I always leave you with. Oh, so that's the croaky slide from Goldman Sachs, if you just want to know why. It's one of my most favorite things, that 30% per annum. Uh, Goldman Sachs research. They sort of, banks have a research and development division. Companies in the top quartile generate 30% per annum. I stole that from them. This is a typical portfolio of somebody's, and so is that that I did. Uh, that was somebody who was being very, very kind and nice to me. Thank you very much. That's somebody else's portfolio. Like I said, if you want to know more about the program, because you want some of the work done for you. You'll all know by now, so I'm not going to um, go into detail about it and all of this. Uh, uh, if you want to know more about it, and we've had great reviews, you know where to go. You know to go there. Uh, and as I say, on the pro when we're on the webinar, we give you a discount as well. My ambition is to float that eventually, have venture capitalists invest in it first. My wife is global head of venture capital for the UK government, so I think she's going to help. Thank you, Stan. Um, uh, to afford to pay for BT. <laughs> I love that code. Is it on BT? It's on BT, is it? Oh, so I might have it for free because I've got EE on my phone. So I think I must have BT Sport. Um, oh, I didn't even realize. Uh, there we go. Thank you all. I was actually going to, you're not going to believe this. I'm going to let you into, have you thought of setting up a SIP platform? No, Simon, I really want to keep my life simple now. If I was in my 30s and 20s, I might create platforms and stuff for people. But now I just want to teach you guys, you do it. Um, and if some of you want me to do the hard work and give you the database and everything, then we'll do that as well. So it's it's. I'd rather just um, teach people what we did in the books and show them that. Um, some websites that I've not shown you uh, uh, include, so don't forget, you can go to my LinkedIn. Do follow me on that. If you want a tour of, this is a new button that's come up. If you want a tour of the program, you can book an appointment there. Uh, that's new. Uh, you can also download a free copy of my book and you can have a free review of your portfolio. Uh, that's a link there. You can download a free copy of the book. Uh, it'll be here somewhere. Um, there it is. Free, free, free. There it is. Free copy of my Investing Unplugged book. Uh, you can download the copy there. There's also my Mind of a Trader, which was published by the FT book, which is free copy as well. You can download uh, from there as well. And yeah, I mean, the way we look at the Great Investors Program is if somebody on a 100K portfolio makes a 20% return in improvement in just one year. Uh, sorry, if somebody on a 500K portfolio makes a 20% return, that's 100K they've made. If on a 100K portfolio, they make a 20% return, that's 20k they've made and it should be a no-brainer for people uh, uh, uh unless they've got too little capital of course in which case hopefully they'll get it eventually anyway that's the place my ambition is to get venture capital funding in this have it go even more global we've got people from new zealand to the bahamas obviously the majority are in the uk it got a whole bunch of americans about 20 percent are from the united states um, so thank you for that uh and if you go there you will see this lovely little thing um, for the first 250 people, and we're approaching that limit now, so I might either raise the limit or um, for the first 250 anyway, it's always going to be me as the lifetime mentor, and it's going to be a fixed price. There'll never be any other price to pay. It's That's it. It's a one-off. It's a one-off price for lifetime access. One-off for lifetime access, and that's it. Thank you all very much. Uh, all of you do enjoy Champions League. It should be starting around now, and shouldn't it? I can't believe I booked this on the Champions League day. Oh, I've got a poll. I'm going to give you one more question. Let's see what you answer on this one. But thank you all for being here, and I appreciate it. And one sort of positive note I want to leave you with is this. You, 
the private investor has more advantages, and you can see them here, what the advantages are you need, than the IFA or the fund manager. You just don't realize it. You don't realize you have more advantages than either of those two groups, and it's on that information there. Anyway, um, for those, thank you very much. Any questions I didn't answer, feel free to email me because um, I always do get around to answering questions, not least because sometimes the questions are so good, they're social media worthy, and I'll just convert it into a post because a lot of other people can benefit from it. So thank you. I hope you found it all useful. Um, I will now go, um, everyone. Ooh, let me uh, move off the screen. There we go. So you can see me. Thank you all very much. Uh, and I'll continue doing the broadcast. I'll make sure there's a repeat of this and you're emailed what the repeat is. Uh, it'll usually comes up on my YouTube uh, at some point. Thank you all very much indeed.